I was dying actually to go to the loo back there. I really was. And you I went. kept thinking, no, I kept thinking I'll miss a bit, you know, I miss a bit that's really important. And I, I, they said to me, go on, you must stand by. And I was glued to it watching. What about, I'd like to ask all of you actually about, uh, about critics. I what loathe is... them and I've gone on record of saying how much I loathe them so many times. It's almost become commonplace, you know, I regard them as. But can I've always heard that the eunuchs and the harem, you know, they're there every night, they see it done every night, but they can't do it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely useless, you'll see, and there's a marvelous... But they're not always, <coughs> Ken, because always there's a grain of truth. That's what's so unnerving. Hardly ever, and even if oh, there were, Ken. even if there were, Maggie, I would say this. They might, uh, they might, in what they say, be saying something true, but they've hardly ever earned the right to say it. You see, that's well, the point. Yes, that's the real point. Yeah. You see, people like um, these sort of, you know, would-be doyens. They write in Sunday newspapers and look upon themselves as sort of, you know, augurs of what's good taste and what's bad taste. They sit there as though from Olympian heights, you know, discussing other people's work and often damning them in the process. I could show you cuttings that name people as being the best, you know, one of the critics said, not only the best in the Western Hemisphere, nay, N-A-Y, nay, nay no. the world. <laughs> and went on to name people that have trod a path into oblivion. I've I've not heard of them ever since, you know. <laughs> and so you begin to think, well, what they worth? Yeah, they're all useless, you see. Yes. Because half the time, they're not really doing what a critic should do, that is communicate some sort of affection and love for his subject to I the reader. They're really not doing that. Want. What they're really mm -hmm. doing is turning a fashionable phrase that might make them well known, them a reputation, you know what I mean? I yes. don't honestly yes. think you yeah. can lump them all together because there are, you know, there are some serious ones I mean, and you can learn things but, but basically sometimes change. You're, 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 you would say that they're, they're to put it crudely, pleasuring themselves rather than... than well, the poor sure. things, they've got a rotten job, obviously. I mean, awesome. it's a rotten job. I admit, I admit that. Like it's, a, it's a very awesome. frustrating job. I know a lot of them are sort of, what is it, short? A lot of them were frustrated playwrights mm. or something. Um, a lot of them frustrated actors, probably. But, um, you know, um, Russell Lovell said that uh, there's something fundamentally ridiculous about criticism insofar as what is good is good without us saying so. Yes, yeah. yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And that, I suppose, really exposes so, the whole thing. So it also brings out the truth of what you said, that the um, communicating enthusiasm Precisely. is what you should do. That's what they I should be doing. Now, there are certain people that can do it. Mm -hmm. There are. I mean, uh, I've read Rex Reed, you know, those profiles in New Yorker, and he really does communicate an atmosphere. You do feel, if you're reading that kind of writer, mm -hmm. you do feel something of the, the atmosphere of the show, the entertainment he enjoyed, mm -hmm. and he um, infects yes. you. And this really happens with good teaching, doesn't it? A good teacher. Yes. He takes you into uh, the realm of English literature, poetry. I mean, my English teacher did. He infected me with a, with a spirit of poetry, you know what I mean? And he introduced me to poets. Uh, most, mostly, I must admit, the Romantics, probably. That was my me melancholic leaning at the time. Shelley Keats, Byron, these sort of people. And um, I've lived with them ever since. I've enjoyed them because he infected me with them. But he didn't do it in any way destructively. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Exactly. Mm. He did it with love and affection. Mm. And I'm sure that the real, you know, the criticism that matters yes. in this sense is that kind of mm. thing, not the thing where they're turning a, a nice phrase, which is a good headline, or something clever, or something catty, or something malignant, which lingers in the memory for a day or so. And it's certainly only for a day or so. Do, do you get really melancholic about? Uh, yes. Do you, do you really I can't sure? bear it. I don't belong to a press cutting agency. There was a time when I longed to see my name in print. Now I see it with dread. Well, and, uh, I, and does it really I, affect you? Oh, I, I always believe it's true. I believe anything well, that's, that's said that's against trouble. me is true. And anything that's said in my favor is flattery. Really? Yes, I never can believe <laughs> yes. that I'm any good at all. No, I, I think, again, well, I, I think yes. all artists desperately need the reassurance from the outside of their own worth. They haven't got it within. Yes. I think this is one of the paradoxes of, uh, of all art, don't you? I mean, yes. that, that though they may appear very often, artists, to be people of power and strength, yes. in actual fact, the reverse is true. They're the most yes. vulnerable people in the world. Yes. I remember going backstage and meeting my idol at the time, Sir Godfrey Toll. Yes. And he actually said to me, I mean, he was giving a marvellous performance in the air, at the Haymarket, and I was sitting in his, in his dressing room, I was full of awe, I was a very young actor, and very green, and I couldn't even find words to say how marvellous I thought his performance was. And he said to me, I've been terribly downcast because a woman brought her little boy to see it. He was ten and he said, my trousers were too high and the socks were showing. <laughs> <laughs> and that worried him. Did, Kenneth and uh, Maggie, can we talk a little bit now? We've been talking a bit about, about showbiz, about something that Sir John was talking about earlier. 
about the whole business of, of preservation and this sort of thing. Is it something that, that concerns you too? I mean, are you basically on Sir John's side and what he says about this? Hmm? Yes, I am. I, 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 I see the problem in another way because I have two brothers and they're both architects and they say, but if we go on keeping things standing, uh, what else can we build? I suppose really our problem here is that we are just a small island. Hmm. But the examples of planning light that you do see, things like the dreadfulness of the Elephant and Castle, which used to be it's a place of humanity awful. and warmth uh -huh. and people, Think which is now just a concrete <laughs> desert yes. and a mess and an absolute disgrace. Yes. And what they've turned the Eastern Centre into is the same thing, just a, just a blight. Frightful. And this sort of thing is I really an absolute disgrace. Moreover, any world. government, What's well, that? exactly, I mean, any government, and it was the Labour government, I believe, which had the power, could have, could have, yeah, could have, could have, could have turned the whole thing into flats for people, left the whole thing standing empty all the time. It was a national scandal, did nothing about it at all. The Office Development Permit, it was introduced by, by um, who was the man, um, the Lord, um, you know, the man that was Foreign Secretary, who was he under the Labour government, government administration? Oh, he introduced uh, the, 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 Brown, uh, George Brown. George Brown. Yes, he introduced the office development uh, prohibition, you know, he stopped offices being built, but only in the last two years of the government, when it should have been done miles before yeah. the first act of, our, of a socialist government, a government which says it's socialist, the first act they should make, is to stop all that and say, homes, homes, the most important thing, makes me sick when I read all this crap about, oh, let's have a youth club, <laughs> let's have a theatre built, or let's have something else built. No good all that. Cultural activities are no good if there's no home to go to, is it? Absolutely true. You must have a home. Yes. So the first and requisite is a home. on the ground. Well, I was going to say... <laughs> Very angry about. Yes. Mm. It really makes me very angry. Doesn't it you to pass a great thing I empty, a great skyscraper mm. empty? Right. I absolutely I think it's an absolute that. scandal. Absolutely. And yet they can all get worked up over a, a couple of pounds in, in their pay packet or something and go on strike. Why can't they have why can't I mean if unions really care, if they're really socialistic and say we care about our fellow man, why can't they force, why can't they march about something like that? Instead of another pound yes, but for that, themselves. But why not a few pounds for somebody else who's really hard up? But that's not the what? union's problem. It's not the union's fault. That, that, that's yes, condition. look, what is that the condition. statue outside the TUC? Have you looked at that statue? But the statue outside the TUC depicts a man helping, doesn't it? He's helping up another man who's on the ground. Yes. And that statue symbolises what the TUC stands for, doesn't it? Of course. Right, well, when a union does something like jeopardising the work of their fellow men, if you stop trains, people can't get to their work, can they? Can they? They can't get to work even. So in doing what you want for yourself, you're jeopardising your fellow men, aren't you? Yes. Well, why can't you act in concert with your fellow men? Why do you have to do something which endangers the livelihood of your fellow men? When that statue represents exactly that, helping, <laughs> because it not might, hindering. Because it might be that the fellow, um, that one fellow, to take two workers, that one fellow is a lot worse off than the other worker. They're not all equal, are they? I mean, if they were all equal, there'd be no problem. Precisely, but it comes down to a question of morality. You don't no, just no, work no. for another pound. When I took my job at three pound ten a week, I asked them in small parts. I come out the army, forty-seven. That's what I got. Forty-seven or three pound ten a week. My digs with her, twenty-five bob all in, and the rest I had the soap and the fags, you know. And <laughs> with a bit of hard picked a shove round the bend because I did the own cleaning. <laughs> but. I saved, and because I wanted to do the job and wanted to do it well, I got on, I got another rep fortnightly, and then after that I got monthly rep, you know, and I got a bit better. I did seven years in the provinces before I came to London. And I think if you're prepared to do that kind of thing, you're doing it, what are you doing it for? You're not saying I want another pound all the time, you're saying I want to do the work better. Yes, but now, that was the kind of morality I was brought up with. But you don't do a job just for what you get, you do the job because but, but you want to do it well. Oh, but Kenneth, can I say I think that's crap? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, I, mean, I really... I've never been so insulted. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, 